three, two, one. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome back. I uh, hope you are enjoying this gorgeous of a day. It is perfect outside right now. Uh, please find a way to uh, go outside and uh, make the most of uh, this time. It is stunning outside. Uh, you wanna take in every minute as you possibly can and uh, take advantage of it because it is literally gorgeous outside. Um, all right, so we have a wonderful Pasha this week, Pashat Chukat. Um, Pashat Chukat is a monster of a Pasha. Uh, not easy to fully appreciate and understand. There's so much depth to this. I'm gonna just scratch the surface with some of the ideas I'm gonna share with you, but um, you know, um, we're gonna try to get through uh, the major ones. The Pasha deals with the death of two of the most remarkable spiritual giants that ever lived, Aharon and Miriam. Um, this is the uh, Pasha that talks about the death of Miriam and Aharon. And we know the Pasha says after Aharon's death, it says, and the Canaanite king, of Arad heard and he warred against Israel. Archachamim asked, ask, what exactly did the king hear uh, that prompted him to go ahead and do battle with the Jewish people? And um, he say that what he heard was, there's one answer that everyone gives that he heard about the death of Aaron, the high priest. And as a result of his death, there was the departure of the clouds of glory that accompanied the Jewish people in uh, his merit. Now, the question remains, why did the death of Aharon render the nation vulnerable to attack? And why did the death um, cause these cows of clouds of glory to depart? So Perkei Avot tells us that Aharon is an Ohev Shalom. He's a Rodev Shalom. He is a, pursue, a lover of peace, a pursuer of peace. And he brings the Mekarim Anashim of Torah. He brings people closer to Torah. So we find that Aaron was forever involved in resolving all sorts of um, domestic disputes, all sorts of quarrels, that Aaron was the guy who you could count on to go ahead and make friendships with people. What did he do? He found that two people were, were at odds with one another. And then he'd come to one of them and said, listen, you know, I heard that, uh, you know, you got into a fight. I spoke to him. You know, he says it's his fault. He deeply regrets it. He'd go to the second guy and he'd say the other guy spoke to the other guy and he would say, oh, he deeply regrets it. They would then meet again and they would embrace, become friends. It is for this reason the entire nation weeps when Aaron passes away. So it's that with the passing of Aaron, a terrible void was left. Who's going to make peace between neighbor and neighbor, husband and wife, father and daughter, father and son, siblings. When Aaron died, arguments erupted again. And this caused the cloud of glory to um, completely dissipate. Why? Because the cloud of glory represents the spirit of God. God's name is Shalom. When there's no Shalom, God departs. This leaves us vulnerable to attack from the outside. The reading of Parashat Chukat always falls out in the month of Tammuz, the month which foretells the disaster uh, of our, for our people, the month which the walls of Jerusalem were destroyed and breached, culminating in the destruction of our holy temple. At the root of the tragedy and all the subsequent tragedies that take place for our people throughout the histories is, is built on baseless hatred. Sinat Chinam is what causes the cloud of glory to depart. It's Sinat Chinam where God abandons us. And it's the opposite. It's acts of ahavat chinam, of love, of true love between us, our friends, our, our spouses, our neighbors. It's in that merit that the presence of God is brought down in our midst. Now, the simple and complex message of Haron is um, desperately needed in our often unfortunate, fragmented, torn families and communities. If we would only follow Aaron's example, we would dissipate the anger that has created ugly walls of animosity that destroy us. In contrast to Aaron, the Torah tells us that, you know, that, they, that they mourn for him for 30 days. We also learn about the death of Miriam, which takes place earlier, but there's no mention at all of mourning. Rather, it says that there was no water for the Kehillah. 
Sometimes silence speaks louder than words. This silence should give us pause. It's the, the where's the mourning? Why, where, why is there no weeping for Miriam? She wasn't as important. Instead, God denies the nation water so that they could become ever cognizant that fresh water of the well in the desert was in all completely coming from the merit of Miriam. During the long bitter years of the Egyptian bondage, Miriam was responsible for inspiring the nation with faith. She put herself on the line to save the lives of doomed Jewish male babies. She stood lovingly over them, guarding them. She stood there watching over Moshe, baby Moshe, while he was floating the basket in the Nile. And she courageously convinced Paro, Paro's daughter, to entrust the baby to take care of Yocheved, right, Moshe's mother. At the splitting of the sea, it was Miriam. She inspired the women to call out to God and praise, to dance and sing in song of thanksgiving. How could people have forgotten everything that Miriam did? Unfortunately, the nature of human beings is that with the passage of time, it's so easy to forget. It's, there's an all too familiar adage that speaks in every generation. And that is, what have you done for me lately? Miriam's death, God reminded the people of the one main pillars of Jewish life. It's called Hakarat Hatov. Gratitude, recognizing the good. They had to remember that it was the merit of Miriam, a woman, that they were granted the powerful life-giving force of water. They had to remember that it was in her merit that they were had the life-sustaining force of water. And with her death, all that was lost. The people had to search for it. They, so that forever after, and we, their descendants, would remind ourselves of this basic principle of Akarat Tov, that we should never take for granted any kindness that was extended to us. Even if that kindness occurred centuries ago. To this day, we sit at our tables on, on, on Pesach, and we thank God for what happened that he took us out of its time. Do we really need to thank God anymore? I mean, it was, it was 20, 3,300 years ago, Mitzrayim. We're still thanking God today? Are we mishnun? Are we crazy? We shan't, we say, Dayenu. And we go through each one of the blessings that God gave us. But <laughs> it's, not only Pesach, <laughs> it's not only Pesach that we stop and thank Hashem, right? We do it every single day, three times a day in our tilot. There is no aspect of life that we can ignore from the most physical to the most spiritual, from the most simple to the most complex. We thank God for every detail, every fiber, every cell, every molecule that exists, we thank God for. But unfortunately, all too often, these expressions of thanks are just empty words, mouthed without feeling, without heart, without soul. We would gain so much if we took a few moments every single day to consider God's many-fold gifts and blessings. If we would consider all the kindness that our families, friends, and others had extended to us. The Well of Miriam is the eternal testimony to our indebtedness. We don't take anything for granted, but we got to count our blessings. If we would only absorb this one simple idea, our lives would have so much more meaning. I had a, a student who called me up this week. He does very well. He says, Rabbi, I'm always obsessing with money. I wake up money. I go to sleep money. I said to him, are you crazy? Do you, when you, when you go to sleep, before you go to bed, do you go to your kids' rooms and look at them into their faces and say that I love these kids and I would trade every single dollar I had to save one of these kids? Do we stop and appreciate that? Do you wake up in the morning when you look over at your spouse and say, thank God I have him or her? Where would I be without them? It's up to us to make ourselves feel gratitude. Gratitude won't happen because someone isn't, you're indebted to someone. Gratitude happens when we remind ourselves. If we think about it, <clears throat> we are going to quickly realize that to live with Jewish, to live with Torah values is to our benefit. You're not going to have any peace. Instead, you're going to have all kinds of worries. Parsha is reminding us that the way in which you find yourself living in a world of simcha, of bracha, is by having a little bit of hakarat tov, a little bit of uh, gratitude. It goes a long, long way. The parsha begins with the decree of the Torah, 
right? Zot chukat haTorah. These are the laws of the these chukim. Those are laws that we don't understand. This is the decree of the Torah. Now, it's a weird thing of saying zot chukat haTorah that we're not talking about the Torah. We're talking about zot chukat haParaduma. Why are we focusing our attention on the Paraduma and not on the actual? Uh, uh, why, why use the words Torah, not Paraduma? So there's a very profound teaching in here. Even as the laws of para aduma, the red calf, right? The red calf, cow, which can be uh, simultaneously purifying and contaminate. They're beyond our comprehension. All the laws of the Torah, even Mishpatim, are laws that we can't begin to understand. It's Shlomo Amelech who says, all this I tested with wisdom. I thought I could be wise, but all this is beyond me. I don't understand any of this. This stuff is way too difficult for me to understand. So here you have Moshe. Uh, you have, uh, you have, sorry, you have, you have a world where mankind is blessed with understanding, yet our understanding doesn't define a reality. So when you want to understand mitzvot, what do we call them? We call them ta'amea mitzvot, right? It doesn't mean reasons for mitzvot. It means the taste for mitzvot. A taste is delicious, right? Who doesn't want a kid to, to taste the delicious things? They benefit from that, right? But tam is just a taste, but it's not the reason why we do the things that we do. It's through the wisdom of our chachamim, our sages, through our studies that we can better appreciate the majesty, the sanctity, the blessings of the Torah. But we have to bear in mind that the definitive reason for the mitzvot are beyond our reach. It's more than that. You see, it's called Zot Chukat the Torah. What does Rashi say? Rashi says that the Satan and the Umat Olam, they come and they, they bother us. How could you guys believe this stuff? Like you're going to take a cow, you're going you're gonna to burn it, and you're going to take its ashes and sprinkle it on and the guy who's impure. And the guy who is impure becomes Tahor. And the guy that is, you know, uh, uh, who's sprinkling becomes impure. This is crazy stuff. And that's what she says. And the question we have to ask ourselves is, who cares what the goyim think about our mitzvot? Who cares what the satan say, says? Why are we worried about the satan and the goyim over here? And the answer is simple. I, I, the answer is very profound, actually. We know that the whole idea of the uh, para aduma came to us as a result of the uh, golden calf. It's a tikkun. It's here to undo the mistake of the sin of the golden calf. So what's the real, what's the real um, claim that the goyim and satan are making against us? Listen to this, guys. This is a very deep idea. What the satan is saying is, God, the Jewish people, they cheated on you. Why do you still have this relationship with them? What is this, this thing is ridiculous that you could... You could forgive and forget. They, they literally broke the relationship. What are you doing over here? How could you maintain this relationship? What are you, crazy? It's over. The, the goyim say the same thing. Yeah, God, they cheated. It's over. What does Hashem say? Zot chukata Torah. You don't understand anything, my friends. You don't understand what love is. You don't understand what a person would do for someone they care about. God says, I love my people. It's a chok. You can't understand it. Just like you can't explain your love of someone to someone else. No one here can go ahead and send me a letter that explains their love. It's just, there's no words to describe those, those feelings. Hashem is saying over here, my relationship with my people, you can never understand. And all the more so, all the other aspects of the Torah itself, we can't begin to understand them. They're beyond our ability to appreciate. So you have this need for unequivocal faith, right? And we see it throughout our parasha. Miriam, the prophetess, Aaron, the priest, they die. Moshe, the lawyer, the ro'en neman, the, ro the loyal shepherd of the Jewish people is denied the right to enter into the promised land, our holy land of Israel. Our human reason can often rebel against these apparently harsh decrees. But who are we to question the will of God? So yes, the entire Torah is like the laws of the red heifer, like the para aduma, beyond the bounds of our finite reasoning. We can't fully understand it. But how else can it be since it's the word of God? Now, this teaching is especially relevant in our generation. 
while we pride ourselves in the intellectual acumen, we fully and we we, we fall pitifully short on, on, on any kind of emuna and any kind of faith. We lack the spiritual stamina at the slightest crisis, collapse, and become angry, bitter, and alienated. We foolishly close the door on our only source of help, which is God, and feel that we're forced, forced to walk alone through life's dark, treacherous valleys, but we're never alone. He loves you. He loves you in ways that you can't begin to understand. I had a, a girl who uh, messaged me yesterday. She says, Rabbi, you know, I want to... Uh, I'm, I'm, my parents are giving me a hard time. I have a Star of David. You know, should I take my Star of David off? I don't want to wear it publicly. They don't want me to wear it publicly. They're afraid that, uh, you know, uh, I might get hurt or harmed. Should I wear my Star of David? This is 2020, my friend, 2021, my friends. We live in a generation where a 21-year-old girl, Jewish, is con his parents are convincing her to take off her Star of David because they don't want her to get attacked by Goyim. That's the world that we live in. So I told her there's never been a time in our history where people need to have pride. Don't be stupid. Don't walk into a bar late at night in a bad neighborhood and wear a big, you know, Star of David. But certainly in the streets of Brooklyn, you can walk around with your Star of David and don't worry about it. This concept of, hi, Mira. Hi, hi Tamima. You want to say hi to everybody? Mommy. In a minute. Let's say, let me just finish up and I'll do this for you, okay? Thanks, Tamima. Okay, there you go. Whoa. This is my little daughter, Tamima, and it's a very, very special parasha because the para aduma has to be tamim. What the word tamim means? Tamim means complete and whole. It also means finished. She's the last one. Finished. All right. Anyway, so uh, we have a parasha. <laughs> hey, Marie. Uh, we end with the idea of pride. We end the idea with gratitude. The Pasha is teaching us that if you want to live in a life of pride, you got to have a life of gratitude. Can't allow yourself to be distracted by the insanity of the world. Be strong, be faithful, because God is intimately in love with you. Wishing you all a Shabbat Shalom Nevarach. We should only share in Smachot. We should only hear good tidings. We should be marching together, Yad be Yad, up in Yerushalayim, seeing our bite, being restored. Um, together in a world of peace. Shabbat shalom, everybody.